Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tissues of the Day. We've taken a small break to collect ourselves and collect the nation. Uh, my name is David, and I'm joined today by... Robert Mackay. How you doing, Robert? I am better than yesterday. <laughs> That's <laughs> the most I can give you. That's fair. Today we're going to talk about the election and we're going to talk about self-care. It's going to be a short episode because literally it's all anybody's talking about anyway. So it's really just two cents, maybe even one cent per person that we're going to share today. Um, so we could just jump into it. Uh, okay. I, I, I do want to start off and say I feel probably similarly to you, Robert, like, uh, except I feel maybe slightly lower than yesterday. Yesterday was anxiety. Today was like, not depression, but just like deflated, you know? Uh, and like, to be fair, like I, I did run in the morning, um, and it took a lot of energy. So I think that is a major part of it, but yeah. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I that's why I said it like today I feel better than yesterday, but like I just feel like I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but it makes a lot of sense. Like I mean, this episode we're talking about the election, we're talking about self-care, and they kind of go hand in hand not only with like COVID, but like this particular period. And and yesterday was oh, it was the 4th, but like the 3rd was the election of the start of the election. And so there was all sorts of, like I was super anxious on that day. That was not a good day. Yeah. And yeah. now it's just kind of drawn out. Totally. I had to like just drown it out on the third. I had a very strong suspicion that like nothing was going to be decided on the third. Uh, and I was right. So, you know, at the very least, <laughs> I took some pride in being able to read the room. Yes. Yes. And, and it's, it, the, the, I mean, even the news reports came back saying that part of me was just like, oh, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, all the advanced you know, ballots came in. Now they're counting the stuff that came on the day of. So they have everything. But no, between the articles and then the reality of watching it, I realized like, oh, yeah, no, it's it's going to be a couple days, maybe more. Totally. So uh, as you can see, we've been screen sharing and it's very obvious as of the moment that we're recording this, it's 630 PST on November 5th. Um, Joe Biden is still a couple electoral votes away. And uh, do you have anything to add to that? It's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's more just like you know let's unpack like what it means to be in this state to be this close and to be going through this and witnessing this um and you know like what the thoughts are of like regardless of the outcome what what does it mean um because when you look at this we've got as you said you know joe biden 264 donald trump 214 these are you know all the breakdowns of the states and that but the really interesting meat comes down to the un, the, the contested i guess you would call it pieces which is georgia north carolina pennsylvania and nevada so they're down here in a more easy to absorb format and when we say close the last time i can think of something so so close from yeah. an electoral perspective from from my view was uh when canada uh, we had the election for whether or not Quebec would separate. And there was so much momentum behind it that it was literally like, I think, a percent or less than a percent, couple percent, somewhere very, very small difference between it. And we almost lost a province. Now we're looking at the U.S. election. And it's crazy. Look at this, right? Look at this. Georgia, 99% in, 49.4%, 49.4%. Two million yeah. four hundred forty-four thousand versus two million forty-four four hundred forty-seven thousand. Yeah, right. Super yeah. tight. Yeah, North I Carolina. Yeah. I was going to say I can't even think of the last uh, presidential election that was this close. It's really wild. Yeah, yeah, and the, and the other cases are the same thing. Like a little bit more gap, forty-eight to fifty. Pennsylvania, forty-nine to forty-nine. So point six percent difference with 90% reporting. So this could turn. I feel that based off of what's going on here, he's getting Georgia and he's getting North Carolina. Pennsylvania might turn. Who knows? Um, what I think is more interesting is like 
what does it mean when you, especially David, being a dual citizen, what does it mean when you see it this close? What does that mean to you? Um, it's tough because I can't quite separate my political views from uh this situation so like yeah for for me personally i don't think donald trump has been good for the country i don't really uh respect his rhetoric and i think a lot of his policies are very backward policies that take things more to like the reagan era um the trickle down economics era the sense that you know it like putting america first and like severing our ties with other countries makes america stronger um and i just really don't think that's the case i think it's like the last sort of gasp of america trying to be self-sufficient in a world that's going to leave it in the dust when you look at like our primary debts are to china and to japan like two of not only the most like politically powerful and economically powerful countries in the world um they're also very technologically advanced and when you have this amount of uh innovation coming from these other countries and a lack of innovation coming from america i think we're just setting ourselves up for even further like economic downturns in the future by saying like oh we just need to keep our factory jobs we need to keep our trucker jobs we need to keep this uh we need to keep like coal plants and like all of this old forms of energy going without innovating it's just it doesn't work for me politically <laughs> um yeah so all that said seeing how close things are just tells me that like the values that people have to reach their political opinions are different uh from mine which is fine i think it's important for people to have different values but you have to be aware of your different values when you're speaking to someone that you disagree with. Because if I try to explain to you how I came to my conclusion through the lens of my values and not your values, you'll never understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that's what yeah. I think about. That's that's great. And you know what? I think there's something insightful there that comes of you being cognizant of like, I don't like this, but I know I need to talk to other people about it. Right. And I know I need to educate other people about it. And I think there is a parallel between that and the problem that is also happening with what you're talking about, where the U.S. is like, let's keep it in America. Let's close off. Let's do our own thing, because that is in um, an unwillingness to play that same role as a nation around rather than talking to the others to understand them and to explain to them, even if you have a difference of opinions, but to work with them, it's easier to close off and be like, no, I'm right and ground your, you know, heels into the, into the floor. Um, and it's my perspective of my thing. So, you know, you translate that into country. It's like, I'm going to keep in my own country and do my own thing. And we don't need you. And I think that that is really problematic and there's a whole other topic we could talk around around the post-nationalist society which i think is a very interesting concept oh my god i've never heard but, of this <laughs> oh god yeah post post-nationalism what <laughs> write it down write it down it's another thing one day okay the the, the and i'm not fully educated on it i don't fully understand it but i know yeah, generally we could the, do some prep work element of yeah yeah um a big element of it is sort of the concept of that like inevitably our world is so interconnected between travel and immigration and technology and trade that the whole concept of like these nations that have borders and restrict things and can close those borders off or open those borders off are kind of ridiculous and that really we need to stop thinking less about nations and to start thinking more about a world because one day oh. we're going to be popping in to like spaceships and going off to other planets so we need to be able to govern our own world before that happens right yeah. so and they use Canada as an example, as a post-nationalist society. We still have a lot of our own problems, other things that we can do. But um, I think it's, it is very indicative of this, of what you were saying. And within this election, that there is this fear uh, because it's already happening. So because all those things are in place and this stuff is happening, 
people get freaked out by it. It's almost like there's a big change coming. And so what do you do? You recoil to protect yourself before that change occurs. And it's all I think ultimately going to happen. But uh, there's a lot of nations doing it, right? Brexit went off and closed off their borders. Um, you know, like other nations are closing off to other nations. And the US wants to do it. They're like, keep the jobs in here, break ties to other nations, because it is just reflective of that fear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I love what we drink in drinks. Yeah. Yeah, let's like, you know, the I think the other problem too is I'm not the biggest fan of Joe Biden. I think he's a pretty, uh, he could even be like, he's moderate. He could even be considered a little right of center. Um, I'm, I think I'm pretty like far left as far as like my ideas go. We don't have to get into everything about it. Um, but I think that's like, Part of the problem with this election is uh, people, I read a statistic from AP News saying that a poll, they had something called VoteCast, and the VoteCast poll asked people to what degree did their vote, um, was it strongly influenced by Donald Trump? So there's this idea of um, negative partisanship, which is the idea not that like I'm crazy about having voted Democratic, but more that... I am just trying to push against a Republican party and voting Democratic seems like the best way to do that. And that's a lot of, I think, what's happening for people now where it's like, I mean, like Biden is the option. Like, what else are we going to do if we want to fight Donald Trump kind of thing? And that's just, uh, it's an exhausting position to be in as a citizen because, I mean, like the to to be like satisfied or whatever within politics i think requires that you're engaged at a local level and you can actually see the differences um that you might be making like in other individuals lives as opposed to this big faceless movement of literally hundreds of millions of people yeah yeah it's you, i think you have a really interesting point there i think there is probably and I'm faced with this as to an extent myself, there is a apathy towards voting in general and, and both Canada and the US have a problem. Like we don't have enough voter turnout, right? We need to have more. This has been historically high for the US and I think that comes from a lot of push and push and push marketing. But um, I think a lot of people kind of see that at like that point of like me putting in a ballot ends there. Like that's my political involvement and that's the most that I can do. And it's just like some people see it as like this is massive and this is a huge right and it represents so much more. But there's a lot of people who are like, it's a piece of paper I sign and I throw into a box. And I'm like, I, I don't really impact the political sphere when when you do. And even if that is the little you do just to have democratic rights, I think is like you should be exercising them and you should be doing them because you don't have to be a big political like out in the streets every day educating yourself because a lot of people don't have time for that. But I think probably the greatest level of impact that you can tangibly feel, especially greater than a ballot, is to do something on your, you know, your local political level where you like you go to a rally or you, you talk to your MP or the equivalent you have in the US. You just like you do something. That's where I think people would really start feeling it. A ballot only. It does it on a conceptual level. Just I'm just going to read some names for people that have won in more small scale elections. And these are wins for LGBTQ plus um, representation in American politics. So we have Sarah McBride. I'm going to put little game show music underneath this. Um, we have Sarah McBride, a Democrat who won a seat in the Delaware Senate and will be the first transgender state senator in the U.S. Woo! We have Adrian Tam, who, uh, we have Adrian Tam, who is Hawaii's only openly LGBTQ plus state legislator. Um, he joined at least 117 LGBTQ plus candidates who have won their races nationwide. We also have Maury Turner for a race in Oklahoma State House for District 88 and they are the first non-binary state legislator in U.S. history and the first Muslim lawmaker in Oklahoma. We have uh, Chevron Jones and Michelle Rayner making LGBTQ plus history in Florida. Uh, uh, Chevron, 
Jones is the first LGBTQ plus senator, um, and Michelle Rayner is the first black queer woman, uh, they're both black, um, to be elected to Florida uh, office. And we have Mondaire Jones, a black gay man who won a race and will represent New York's 17th congressional district in the U.S. House. We have Kim Jackson, who has been elected to the Georgia State Senate. She is the first LGBTQ plus state senator in Georgia. And finally, we have 26-year-old Taylor Small, who declared victory uh, as a state legislator in Vermont. So that's lovely. I was telling my brother, I was like, people talk about emboldening sometimes when they say, oh, when there's harsh rhetoric from Donald Trump, it emboldens other conservatives and people on the fringes to have, um, you know, gross behavior and gross speech and stuff. But emboldening has a, uh, like, a, a, a backlash or whatever effect as well, like a positive backlash, <laughs> where literally, like, we have great uh, things happening on smaller levels of politics. Um, so, yeah, I really hope to hear more about, especially some of those senators, but even those House of, um, yeah, those representatives in the House. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is very positive. And there are other positive things to look at this. You know, um, the fact that there is such a massive turnout right the this is a historical high in terms of voter turnout so that's great and goes to show that if given the right catalyst people will come and people will vote another thing is is that i think part of what made the voter turnout so high is a little bit of a silver lining to the covid world is that this is the first time or i don't know if it's the first time but a very like a particular time in the u.s where suddenly they really made advanced voting a thing Right. And they enabled it more by having all these ballots that people were sending in in advance. Um, so suddenly people were able to vote in a different way and it made it more accessible. And lo and behold, even yeah, Trump was there and to get Trump out is a big motivator. But maybe it's just also because like, oh, if you open up the options to vote, more people will show up. You know, there's a bunch of people who weren't doing it before. So 100%. there is a silver lining to that uh, on the election front and on the COVID front. Yeah, when you allow people to vote puh, on their weekends, as opposed to during their week, voting is still not a national holiday. It's still being held on Tuesdays or like random weekdays every year. Um, that is a form of voter suppression to not allow people um, to like vote on voting day and like to make it very weird and difficult to vote ahead of time. So I think that's a great point. Yeah. Or the hours are weird. The locations are weird, you know, and now back onto the Debbie Downer side, some of that might be undone. All right. So the big thing about Trump is that it's like it's going to be so tight that he's going to push for all these ways to like ignore mail in ballots, make them invalid, you know, launch political or not political, but uh, legal um, campaigns or not campaigns, but legal <laughs> battles against the votes that have been placed, which he's already done. So like Michigan and uh, Wisconsin, he already filed two legal suits against it for a recount and to clarify if actually he won or Biden won. Yeah, yeah. And from everything and, I've heard, yeah. that usually amounts to a difference of like hundreds of votes. It's really never a sort of like landslide amount of fraud or whatever. Um, and we'll probably keep dealing with this for a uh, couple weeks at least of this sort of sense of like recounting and disputing and all this stuff and so you know watch with a grain of salt watch while closely monitoring your own uh mental health and energy levels which could lead us into our next section if you're yeah ready. <laughs> perfect i was just thinking that so speaking of the positivity yeah how are you taking care of yourself in the midst of this anxiety inducing election plus the past, you know, COVID times, because self-care, it's always been like self-development and self-care has always been a thing that I've been, I've enjoyed and mm -hmm. I've pursued in my life. But in this year of 2020, it has been massively important. Definitely. So it's a couple things because it varies day to day. Um, some days I will wake up and I will not really want to exercise that day. Um, I'm not so disciplined about it that like I do something every single day, but I do 
value it on the days that I do it. <laughs> so it's usually like two or three days a week. I have something that like breaks a sweat or is like enough of a workout that I'm sore the next day. Uh, so there's that. And then on the sleepier days, it's, uh, you know, some form of work, some form of journaling, maybe something a little headier, uh, and maybe once or twice a week, I'll do a small, uh, chocolate edible. I've gotten into those lately. Um, and they can be quite nice, uh, again, depending on the mood that I'm in. <laughs> um, cause like I, I took one two nights ago. Yeah. On election night. Um, and we were just watching, uh, TV. We were watching Watchmen, the HBO series. Um, and it was quite nice. So those are big ones. Yeah. I like reading, uh, and hanging out with family. We've been doing some game nights. We've been playing pickleball as well. And that's all been lovely. I've been playing or I, when I was down in the U S for two months, I played a bunch of pickleball and I really enjoyed it. Nice. I want to, I want to ask you about something. So of those things that you do that are things that feel good, things that are self-care based. When there's one that's really important to you that you don't do, how do you feel about it? Hmm. I'm trying to think like the one that affects me the most. <sighs> I think the one that affects me the most is like not feeling productive. Um, so for me, like it is a, a form of self care to like keep working in some ways. And of course there are days when I'll just do some work for like three or four hours as opposed to the full day. Um, but you know, I'm taking classes, I'm working on a comic. I do little bits of editing and like web design, like a couple different plates spinning. So there's literally something for me to do on any given day. Um, and all of that is just within reason as well, because I'm very like religious about giving myself a weekend as well. I tr I just, I count my days and I'm like, okay, well that was five days in a row. I'm taking two days off. Like I just need to not think about work. So yeah, those are the good, good ones. <laughs> Great. So, uh, I mean, th that's, that's awesome. I mean, I was fishing somewhat to see whether or not like if one of those things are important to you, such as like working on one of your projects or doing one of your things, if you don't do it, whether or not you, it sits okay with you. Mm -hmm. So for me, mm -hmm. um, because I have to deal with, uh, I like being idle, being non-productive is really tough for me. I'm very self-critical and I'll get really hard on myself about that. And so I have learned a lot in this way. Like a big thing for me is forgiveness forgiveness of myself of that like there is you know almost like the equivalent to your exercise and i do this too that i'm pretty religious with within my exercise because it is a good outlet it feels productive but it also is just like kind of an outlet for me there's days where i'm like if i force myself to do this i'm going to feel more stress than it will heal so i'm not going to do it and i'm mm -hmm. going to forgive myself for that or it's like yeah. yes there's this thing that i want to do but I'm going to forgive myself of that and not do it today. Because the thing is, what I find is you still generally find a productive thing to do, especially if you're a productive person. Like I am, I am like, I could call like a high vibration person. And so I'm always going to do a thing because it brings me down. Um, but it's not always going to be the same and it's going to change up. And I have to give myself a lot of forgiveness around that. And it's really helped my mental health where it's just like, you know what, Robert, you did A, B, and C today. You may have not done D, E, and F, maybe even just D. And we all love the D, <laughs> but, yes. uh, if I don't do that, uh, then I'm just be like, that's okay because A, B and C happened. Yeah. So I think forgiveness is really big. Um, walks are another thing for me. Oh, um, I find it's just like, especially if I don't exercise, just going on a long walk. And we you know what's worked well for me too, is, um, making sure that my walks are different. I got into a bit of a habit where I walk the same path and I go through the same area. So it felt like drudgery, almost like you could consider your job or just the, the, the activities you do in the day. It was little things like that as like, okay, today I'm not exercising cause I'm not feeling it. I'm going to forgive myself of this, but I still am like got energy. So I'm going to go do a nice long ass walk and I'm going to go on a different path. Cause that's going to show me something new, reveal something new to me. So that's something that's worked really well for me. Um, I've been take, um, listening to an audiobook. I've never done audiobooks before. Oh, yes. And I've been doing it on positive intelligence. Yes. How's that been? Yeah. 
it's been good because you know i think it was you who had recommended this to me Mm -hmm. is that it's like sometimes it's just good to combine it with a mundane activity or something else that feels like you're doing something but you're still taking in the audiobook so that's where i've been using it is on walks um primarily yeah that's awesome um i also want to throw a book recommendation out um and i'll have you say more about positive intelligence in a second too i read recently a book called burnout by emily and amelia nagoski n-a-g-o-s-k-i and it's a book about stress management and it's awesome Um, The basic bullet points are some of the best ways to manage stress are physical activity, um, like intimacy, like closeness with people that you care about, like, and some sort of, uh, they say like hugs and like romantic contact are like really, really helpful. Um, Or even just like pleasurable contact, like getting a pat on the back from like a friend or family member, like can really help out. And can you repeat that? So we get that down. uh, Which the book? Yeah, the book is, it's recorded, Robert. Just listen to the recording again. (laughs) Burnout by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. Um, And I'm trying to think what were some others. Uh, And a lot of stuff that you were talking about of like being aware of your self-talk and like your mental um, like (laughs) criticisms of yourself and uh, the people around you, how much that really affects how we feel and like how much uh, stress we're feeling from something. Can you say some more about positive intelligence? Yeah, actually this transitions really well because two things. One, I think the physical intimacy thing, I actually had a breakthrough on that recently. I, um, the last time I got a massage was January of this year. And then, you know, COVID happened. So many different things happened in my life that added untold levels of stress that I haven't felt in a really long time. And I had been working out during this because it is an outlet for me. And I had just literally been feeling physical tension in my body, but I had been kind of ignoring it because I'm like, yes, of course I'm tense. I'm stressed. But I just booked a massage maybe two days ago and went through it and it had been so long and there was so much release that came from that massage. And not only was it about the massage and they say that like emotions are caught up in your muscles. And I truly believe that is to some extent because it really helped me overall. Um, just the physical touch just having somebody treat me intimately touching me because like being single and being living alone and being isolated in covid i've had at for a long time there was zero touch and then i started getting yes the occasional hug maybe the elbow bump maybe somebody will shake my hand but somebody to caress my back somebody to like snuggle somebody to just like like rub my arm i have been missing that so much so in that massage it made such a difference and the thing i'm torn on really about that is that i'm like all i'm really gonna get it from is a close friend right now because i am not dating anyone and i and i don't know when i'll date somebody again um and so i'm just been like holding my hugs longer Mm -hmm. and if i have a close friend i'm like hey when we watch this movie can i just like be beside you (laughs) it makes such a difference yeah Um, yeah i think that's really great I, I'm so happy that you're putting that out there because I think, uh, you know, I've definitely experienced that a lot myself. Like I started just last night as I was sort of falling asleep, I was like a little antsy listening to a podcast or whatever. Um, and I just had my pillow like right next to me, like basically spooning my pillow. Cause I'm just like, ugh, like I just need like some, just like something, something right here, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, that's huge. Yeah, and asking I, for um, it because realizing that you need it is like half of it and then <laughs> trying to meet that need in some way is the second half yeah totally and uh there was something you brought up in that so this is, i'm going to transition into positive intelligence yeah i took a um, mental health workshop through work recently and in it they mentioned positive intelligence and i've like i've heard of like emotional intelligence like eq and stuff like that but i'd never heard of this pq is a thing it was largely coined within this book called positive intelligence by um what's pq sorry positive like PQ quotient is like the measurement um i think i think it stands for quotient i'm not too sure but um it's a po- positive intelligent quotient yes uh and it is by a dr Sh- uh, shirzad shamin and this is the book I'm listening to on audiobook right now. And the whole premise of it really is just kind of focused on saboteurs. So the the negative speak. So which I think was referenced in the book you read. 
And I am horrendous at that, about that. And I realized it during this period um, with the things that I had gone through that I'm really, really, really bad on self-negative talk and putting myself down and blaming myself. So I went to the, I started listening to the book. I'm still very early into it. And I took the test and it identifies what all your- Can I just like, stop you for a sec Saboteurs too? are, yeah. Um, like even the way that you're phrasing, talking about your like negative self-talk is negative which is fascinating. It's such like a mind fuck, like when you realize when it's happening. Um, but something I would even try is saying like, well, I want to be more gentle with myself. You know, this book is teaching me to be more gentle with myself. Um, framing yeah. it in some way where it's, uh, where it is like a positive thing that you're moving toward as opposed to a negative thing that you're trying to get rid of. Yes. Yeah. Because even that, right? And this is all tied to sort of the theories that they have around it, around if you build habits in that way, you, the lens you use, the framing you use, the wording you use, it will rewire your brain to be more in a positive state. And I know it sounds cheesy. Some it's feel it's un, uh, unbelievable. But it really has because I've also I've I've done personal development stuff that has also focused on this like there's like the a book that I read called the, uh, oh gosh, I have the book right here, Happiness Advantage, um, and other books that just focus on like positive thinking and positive psychology. And I found just through all of that, that it is true. There are certain things that if I build them into a habit, I'm ultimately just more positive and my stress levels are less. So it, it just adds to that whole bundle, I think. Yeah. So thanks for catching me on that because I need to do that. We both need to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really, uh, yeah, it'll change your life once you start noticing both how your brain affects you. Like, you know, there's just this loop that we're in constantly where it's like we have feelings and thoughts that are loosely related and behaviors that are caused by feelings and thoughts and sometimes are... Uh, Sometimes it's not clear, like, did the behavior start us feeling this way or did the thought start that behavior, you know? And we're just like constantly in this cycle of navigating, um, like where our emotional state is coming from. And sometimes, you know, we can stop like, um, and be more critical of how we're talking to ourselves and say like, well, this isn't helpful. This is <laughs> like, I, I want to, um, do better kind of thing. Uh, and sometimes the change is getting out of your routine and like getting out of these ruts because it could be that like there's behavior that's also feeding into feeling like crap. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not going to pop psychology the entirety of America, but like if the last two episodes of this podcast are any indicator of like my opinion on this stuff, I think the amount of media that we've taken in regarding this election and this whole race um, has like drastically shifted how people feel and how they relate to um, their place in politics and how they relate to each other, uh, people they agree with and disagree with. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. And I think it has... It's, it's polarizing. And I think there's been a lot of fear and a lot of uh, anxiety built into the way the media represents it and talks about it and how you should relate to it. So when the day came, I, I had just this preemptive like anxiety and stress about it. And it just started being realized because the thing was dragged out and there was uncertainty. And I was just like, it's exactly what they were going to say. And there was also just like the initial fear of like Trump looked very kind of certain and on par to start and now it's shifting more, but it's still there is no clear winner, right? Yeah. It is not set until it's set. So what better thing to do than to just break out of that habit? So like, even just with the election, my thing was like, only look at it at certain times. I looked at it once an hour, once every few hours. And eventually I was like, okay, I can see a stall. I'm going to stop and do other things until the next day. And I think to your point also, it's kind of like why I, on my walks, I'm like this walk, I'm doing something new because I think you do need to get out of that rut. You do need to change up with the things because there's something, you don't know if it's like your thoughts or your behaviors or vice versa, but there is something that you keep doing that you need to change. So why not try something new? Why not try a different technique, a different path, a different way of talking to yourself or just a new activity, whatever it is, read a new book, go do a new thing. Because that might then unearth 
where the change needed to happen. Yeah. And so I've been I've been trying to do that as much as possible, um, at least on my kind of self care side of things. Totally. Speaking of self care, I really want to put this tidbit out here because this is a shout out to my friend Daniel Crow, who I talked to and had an amazing talk to, and he gave a really good perspective on this. Is that he he put this idea into my head that blew up my brain. He's like a lot of people look at self care, the topic, as taking a long bath buying a scented candle, buying that piece of, you know, cake that you wanted, you know, treating yourself. But his perspective on it, and I could agree, is that um, he that's, that could be self-care, but self-love, um, I think people mix the two terms together. Self-care is like those, those little, maybe those practices, but self-love, which I had always associated to those actions, he's like, it should be about when things get tough, we don't turn against ourselves around it. So loving yourself is just, just, you know, you don't turn the battle against yourself when it shows up. You look at it in a different perspective, that you don't blame yourself. And I think that all goes back to this whole, like, self-care and wording things differently and being more positive towards yourself and trying new things that make you more positive because things will get tough and heavily, but your plasticity, your willingness to flex with it, uh, I think is really tied to that sense of if you love yourself, you're not going to blame yourself. You're going to be like, I did my best. This thing's out of my control. This thing's within my control. I've worked really hard on and I'm a great person. It did not turn out well, but that's okay. Totally. I mean, there's even within this um, find your saboteur, it's like a quiz that you can take online and you can learn a little bit about what your habits might be. Um, some of the habits include things like um, one is called hypervigilant, which is sort of like this nervousness. Another is like stickler, which is like attention to detail and, um, you know, being a stickler. Uh, another is victim. And like those three are definitely in the line of uh, the stuff that you're talking about where they like it's really hard to look at any of those as like self-loving qualities um you know and like so what's your much, top three yeah my top three are a uh, hyper achiever restless and pleaser yeah mm. i am a restless at 9.4 this is out of 10 mm. stickler at 8.1 and a pleaser at 8.1 mm. fascinating um because the other thing i wanted to say too was like uh oh i just had it um with these with the self-love thing, so much of self-love is like, where am I at today? Like right now, like I don't have to think about tomorrow. I don't think I have to think about five years from now. Do I like myself today? Like, am I worthy of love today? And that's so like fundamentally, like, <laughs> like just the game changer, you know, if a person can't love themselves today or like be somewhat content with where they are today, um, they will never be content because it will always just be shoved off and, um, put to the side. That's not to say that you can't have things that you want to do and things that you want to change. Um, but if you can't like trust yourself to make these changes, then, uh, or if you don't love yourself enough to think that you're worth making these changes, then you'll just keep, uh, self-sabotaging, you know? Yeah, I think probably, and if I remember correctly, of the different saboteurs uh, listed, I think hyperachiever and hypervigilant are probably two of the um, hardest against that, right? Work the, work the most against that because um, that is a piece that has worked really well for me to stay grounded and be okay is like, am I okay today? Do I love myself today? Because there is a lot of things you can think about into the future and about the potentials of things that are happening, but I'm just like, so many of my stressors because I'm a very future focused person and I'm very like a type planner are tied to that. So I try, I have to keep bringing myself back to like, am I okay today? Am I healthy today? Am I got a job today? Do I have, you know, money today? Like <laughs> yeah. how, how am I okay today? And do I love myself today? That is, um, a really simple, but I think effective. Approach. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the last maybe thing, if you have anything else that you want to add in closing, feel free. Um, but the, like, I do want to remind people that social media and TV coverage and 
like media coverage in general, um, are all designed to instigate conflict. Like advertising and like the dramatizations that you see on TV are meant to make people feel uneasy because then we're more susceptible to being advertised to or more susceptible to um, come back uh, to that program and like be a repeat viewer. Um, And we're more likely to uh, like overeat to try to like manage stress or buy things to feel like we're uh, taking care of, you know, either like managing some sense of like an emergency that's happening or literally just buy things to soothe ourselves and like be consumers um, in our homes all the time, you know? So I just say that to remind people that like, and to even remind myself, because literally like I've done so much shopping recently i just got like a big old tablet for drawing which is a tool um but it also costs money you know uh and who's to say like how much longer i would have waited if i weren't as stressed or whatever but just to like keep this in the back of our minds when we are continually checking online news feeds when we keep going back to the same channel over and over again um sort of feeding into this machine that says um, you know, the most important thing is profit and conflict, you know? Whew, yeah, that, that is heavy. And I would, I would agree to that. I think there's two points I want to make on this. One is I call that the scroll hole, Yeah. uh, where I, if I catch myself in it, if I catch myself going through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, even web, like websites, just like web results and stuff like that. I stop myself and I have to turn it away because I find it just, it stimulates me in a negative way. It gets me into that negative space because I am taking in that conflict or that comparison of like, what are they doing? And why am I not doing the same thing or whatever? You know, I just find it ultimately doesn't really serve me. But the second point I have is just that I ultimately think that like, we're we're not getting rid of it. Social media is going to be here to stay. It's going to be around. I'm going to continue to use it. And I think we're each going to continue to use tech and social media and marketing and media absorption is still going to occur. I think you need to find the ones that are the most triggering for you. The ones that you find put you into those negatively stimulated places and find out how to mitigate them or stop them entirely. And it's going to be different per person. Some people, it's like, just don't scroll through it. Other people are like, get rid of your account. Other people are like, don't post to it. Or if you post to it, post to it for something that is good for you. Whatever the way it is that you can relate to that media consumption uh, or contribution to media, make sure it is as healthy as it can be because there's so many ways to do it. Um, So just, yeah. Yeah, and check out Find our other episodes right for an even more in-depth yeah. discussion <laughs> on yeah, yeah. Uh, on this exact subject. Um, you know, the the value of things like social media and uh, the media, etc. Um, cool. Well, I hope I'm pretty sure this was shorter. I don't think we've hit an hour yet. I keep forgetting to set a timer before we start, um, but that's fine. You know, putting a watch on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we're right at about forty-five. Um, cool. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to mention it to a friend. Uh, oh my gosh, there was one more thing I did want to say. Um, you know, when I talk about conflict, when I talk about checking, uh, election results and like just checking things in general, I don't necessarily mean being complacent. Um, I do think there are very important fights to keep having and ways to stay engaged, but a lot of the best engagement does not happen on social media and it does not happen sitting watching TV. (laughs) Um, It's writing to your Congress people. It's making those telephone calls. It's working at these text banks and whatever else, you know? Um, Yeah. I just want to put that out there. Or talking to another person. Yeah. I'm aware of the optics of me saying like, ah, just fucking relax, man. (laughs) Well, like, you know, I'm that it's my privilege to be able to say that, but Yeah cool so yes again thanks for tuning in uh robert love you i'm gonna see you soon in a couple weeks in person not on zoom (laughs) so that'll be nice Mm -hmm. and uh, amazing tune in next time to another tissue of the day bye-bye